Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. May I now begin the, deba the debate. Uh, may I ask those members who wish to speak to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to speak to and move the motion. Uh, up to nine minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the Cabinet Secretary's absence, I will open the Stage 1 debate on the Scottish Crown Estates Bill. The Bill proposes a new framework for management of Scottish Crown Estate assets. This includes reform of the main duties of the manager, duties that are now over 50 years old. The Bill also includes new powers for the Scottish Ministers to change who manages Scottish Crown Estate assets and opens up the possibility of local authorities and communities taking control of the management of assets in their area. We want to maximise the benefits of the Scottish Crown Estate for communities and the country as a whole, while ensuring that assets are well maintained and managed and high standards of efficiency, openness and accountability. This is vitally important as the Scottish Crown Estate consists of a diverse portfolio, including 37,000 hectares of rural land, half of Scotland's foreshore, urban property and seabed leasing rights for activities such as renewable energy. Until recently, these assets were managed on a UK-wide basis. The Scottish Parliament received legislative competence for the management under one of the key recommendations of the Smith Commission. At the point of devolution last year, Crown Estate Scotland Interim Management undertook management of, of the assets. The bill was introduced in January 2018. As per the Smith Commission recommendations, this bill provides opportunities for councils and community organisations to manage assets themselves. There are two mechanisms in the bill <coughs> uh, for changing who manages a Scottish Crown estate. Firstly, either a transfer of management to a local authority, a community organisation or a Scottish public authority, or uh, secondly, a direction of the existing manager to delegate the day-to-day -day management to a local community local authority, community organisation or Scottish public authority. Under a delegate, delegation, the existing manager may continue to hold ultimate responsibility for managing the asset. The Cabinet Secretary's intention would be to use the new powers to enable future devolution of management on a case-by-case -case basis. This will allow decisions to be taken carefully and with the approval of this Parliament, while recognising that a one-size-fits-all approach is simply not suited to such a diverse range of assets. The effective and continuing management of the Scottish Crown Estate is important for Scotland as a whole. So we've made provision in, <clears throat> in case things go wrong at any point in the future. We've specified that the legislation can require community organisations to notify us of changes to their constitution, which would result in the transferee ceasing to be a community organisation. We can also transfer management of an asset from a local manager to Crown Estate Scotland or the Scottish Ministers as a holding measure to ensure tenants aren't affected if a community organisation struggles to fulfil its duties in managing an asset. We've included new duties uh, to maintain and enhance the value of the assets and to obtain market value in a way that is likely to contribute to the promotion or involvement in Scotland of economic development, regeneration, social well-being, environmental well-being and sustainable development. Although buying and selling property is part of the management of the Scottish Crown Estate, there is a presumption against sale of the seabed. We've taken powers in the bill to restrict or control the power of, transferee to, or, of a transferee or delegate to sell part of, of or all of the asset they manage. In particular, sales of the seabed by any manager would require ministerial consent. We believe this will maintain the integrity of the Scottish Crown Estate and uh, protect... Yep. Alex Rowley. Thank you. you will be aware that many organisations in Scotland believe strongly that the sale of the seabed or foreshore should also require the consent and the decision should lie with this Parliament. What's your view on that? Joe Fitzpatrick. I think, I think the member makes a good point, and I think that the minister has been clear that this parliament is, is a, an Im, important part of all the process going forward. But I'm sure the minister, the, the cabinet secretary, will carefully consider your, your point in, in due course. Um, we, we, the financial flows resulting um, to the Scottish Crown Estate are not straightforward, so I, um, I'll explain what they entail. The Scotland Act places restrictions on how the assets how the assets and um, other activities minus the costs of managing the assets is paid to the Scottish Consolidated Fund. 
The UK Government's annual block grant to Scotland has been reduced by the estimated amount of net revenues earned by the Scottish Crown Estate asset, assets in 2016-17, so that's a reduction of £6.1 million. Whoever manages the assets clearly has to maintain and seek to enhance the value of those assets and the incoming, uh, income arising from them, otherwise Scotland is out of pocket. Yes. Stuart Stevenson. Um, notwithstanding the financial issues, I'm sure the Minister will welcome that uh, it is not now simply a financial issue in the way that uh, the Crown Estate is to manage things, but also sustainable management is an important part of it, and I'm sure that will be widely welcomed. Joe Fitzpatrick. I think that, that the, the member makes a good point, and that is a point that um, is that you know the bill specifically makes allowance for that, as well as obviously the importance of maintaining um, and, and potentially enhancing the assets that we have, which is an asset for for, for Scotland. Out with the bill, we are committed to distributing the net revenue generated by marine assets out to 12 nautical miles to island and coastal local authorities. Um, this local function will not be hypothecated, but we expect local authorities to be transparent and accountable to their communities on how that money is spent. When management of Scottish Crown Estates assets uh, was devolved, we inherited arrangements which allow the manager of the asset to retain 9% of the gross revenue uh, for investment to the estate, in the estate, for example, for new farm buildings or purchase of new assets. And we're keeping the facility in the bill for a manager to be able to retain a a proportion of gross revenue for investment in maintaining the estate, but we're taking the power um, to be able to vary in future the percentage that can be invested. It might be that some assets need more capital investment than others, and we want to provide for that. The bill also seeks to ensure that the assets can be maintained in future through cross-subsidy. It's important to keep the ability to cross-subsidise when there is um, several local managers of the Crown estate assets. We are therefore taking powers to direct a manager to transfer money to other managers' accounts. In that way, a community can take over management of a local asset. If there were a good case demonstrating benefits to Scotland, even if the asset does not currently generate enough income to cover costs. To be clear, this money would come from a manager's Scottish Crown Estate accounts and not from the manager's other accounts. The bill requires a strict separation between a manager's Scottish Crown Estate accounts and any other accounts held by the manager. We are clear that a robust governance framework is required to provide this Parliament and the citizens of Scotland with assurances and transparency concerning the management of the Scottish Crown Estates. The bill sets out a national, framework, a national governance framework specif specifying accounting and reporting procedures to ensure sufficient openness about the management of the assets, whether local or national. The national governance framework also comprises a national strategic management plan, managers' own management plans, annual reports from managers and measures to promote consistency in reporting and accounting. Saying officer, the strategic management plan and annual, annual reports will be laid in Parliament so members can oversee management of the Scottish Crown Estate. The bill provides for members to approve transfer of the management of assets and accounts will be audited by the Auditor General. All this provides a robust but proportionate framework for the governance and oversight of a valuable portfolio of assets which, over which the Parliament now has stewardship. In closing, I have set out the purpose of the bill. It enables the Scottish Crown Estates to be used for the economic, social and environmental benefit of Scotland and its people. I appreciate that it is a highly technical piece of legislation and I thank the members of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee for the careful and constructive way they have dealt with the various issues. I therefore move the motion that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Scottish Crown Estate Bill. Thank you. I now call on Graeme Day to speak on behalf of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee for up to eight minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the convener of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, I very much welcome the opportunity to highlight our views on the Crown Estate Bill as contained within our Stage 1 report, albeit time constraints will curtail the detail that I'm able to go into on our views. The committee welcomes the devolution of the Crown Estate as a significant recommendation of the Smith Commission report, having previously supported the interim arrangements for the management of the estate, which were put in place in April 2017. The committee welcomes the Scottish Crown Estate Bill and the provision for the longer-term management of Scottish Crown Estate assets, including the 37,000 hectares of land, seabed, mineral and fishing rights, coastlines and rural estates. 
The bill provides a clear focus on ensuring the estate's assets are managed sustainably by those who are best placed to do so, whether that be the Crown Estate Scotland, a local authority or a community group. The committee supports the intention of the bill, which seeks to move beyond a focus on profitability to encompass other such factors such as regeneration, social well-being, environmental well-being and sustainable development when deciding how an asset should best be managed. This is the right approach, one which seeks to recognise a different ethos in Scotland. However, we believe there is scope to go even further. The committee therefore welcomes the Scottish Government's commitment in their response to our Stage 1 report to consider guidance to ensure that not only are these wider environmental factors taken into account, but that their consideration can be clearly evidenced. As part of the committee's consideration of the bill at Stage 1, we heard from a range of stakeholders, including those representing the estate's four rural estates, those representing the estate's non-agricultural assets and those involved in the strategic direction and governance of Crown Estate Scotland. The committee also carried out a confidential survey of existing Crown Estate Scotland interim management staff to ensure that their views or concerns were captured in our work. The committee wants to place on record its thanks for the evidence provided by all and for the constructive engagement we enjoyed. The committee was pleased to note that many of the Crown Estate's tenants had already noticed significant improvements since the management of the estate had been devolved to Scotland. This includes the creation of a tenants group on the four rural estates, leading to improved communication between the tenants and factors. The committee is hopeful that the bill offers an opportunity to further, for further progress to be made. While the committee is broadly supportive of the general principles of the bill, we've made a number of recommendations in relation to what's included in it and what is to be left to further regulation and guidance. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee also made a number of recommendations with which the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee agrees. Broadly, these recommendations seek to ensure that where significant decisions are being taken about the future of the Crown Estate, there is sufficient parliamentary scrutiny of each decision. Uh, the committee is conscious, however, of the need to strike an appropriate balance between matters that are operational decisions for Crown Estate Scotland and those that require further scrutiny. The bill offers opportunities to local authorities and community organisations to take on the management of Scottish Crown Estate assets. But the committee believes that the seabed as a national asset should continue to be managed nationally and the bill should be amended to ensure it cannot be sold under any circumstances. The committee recommends that the Scottish Government outlines clearly which Crown Estate Scotland asset it anticipates will continue to be managed on a national basis and which can be devolved to a local level. Presiding officer, the extent to which the Crown Estate in Scotland is likely to become fragmented as a result of the bill was a concern of some uh, stakeholders. The committee also considered the issue of cross subsidisation that is, where the income from one asset subsidises an asset that is less profitable. This process currently works well on a national basis, but may prove more problematic in future. The committee has therefore recommended that Crown Estate Scotland establish and maintain a list of assets, uh, outlining which are currently profit or loss making and clearly setting out any associated liabilities. The committee was also of the view that the process to manage the cross subsidisation of assets should be subject to the affirmative procedure and a definition of what constitutes significance or significant value in relation to an asset should be clearly set out on the face of the bill. Managers of the Crown Estate Scotland assets can currently retain 9% of gross revenue for reinvestment in an asset. The committee is keen to ensure that the definition of community extends to communities of interest to allow for broader interest groups to be able to take on the management of assets and for these groups to be appropriately supported in doing so. Uh, I therefore welcome the Scottish Government's undertaking to consider this matter further in advance of stage two. The committee sees clear benefits in retaining national oversight of the estates, rural estates, offshore renewables, energy related assets and other cables and pipelines, albeit acknowledging that it may on occasion be beneficial for an asset to be managed at a local level and we therefore uh, recognise the need to retain provision for this. The committee is content that local authorities should be able to manage smaller scale tidal and wind projects within 12 nautical miles of shore where they can demonstrate appropriate expertise. The committee uh, therefore welcomes the Scottish Government's commitment to include this process and criteria and guidance uh, for this to be available by the time the sections on transfer and delegation come into force and for there to be further consideration of the inclusion of a definition of good management and guidance. 
Uh, presiding officer, Crown Estate Scotland tenants are generally happy with the way in which Crown Estate Scotland interim management is being run. Tenants feel that devolution has brought an increased feeling of connectivity with the estate, improved communication and more involvement in decision-making processes. Tenants regard Crown Estate Scotland as a good landlord and feel that the Scottish Crown Estate Bill offers the opportunity to make further improvements to how the estate is run. The committee seeks further clarification from the Scottish Government as to the rationale for setting the figure for retention at 9%, why there are no plans to alter this at present, and what arrangements they will put in place to ensure that 100% of net revenues generated out to 12 nautical miles will be used for the betterment of coastal communities. The bill contains a number of useful mechanisms designed to improve transparency and accountability. The concept of good management, however, remains undefined. The committee suggests the Scottish Government should consider including such a definition either on the face of the bill or in guidance, and that the process and criteria for deciding the suitability of a potential manager should be clearly set out in guidance. The committee agrees that the bill will bring benefits not just to the estate, but to Scotland as a whole, by ensuring that community empowerment and sustainability are at the heart of Crown Estate Scotland's future. Presiding officer, I am therefore pleased on behalf of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee to commend the general principles of Scottish Crown Estate Bill to the Parliament and recommend that these be agreed. Presiding officer. I call on John Scott for up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and may I begin by declaring an interest as a farmer and refer members to my register of interest for other interests. Can I also welcome this Stage 1 debate today on the Scottish Crown Estate Bill and say at the outset that the Scottish Conservatives will be supporting this bill at decision time tonight. It is worth noting at this stage that the income from the Crown Estate Scotland, which previously went to the UK Treasury, will now accrue to the Scottish Government and how the Scottish Government manage these assets in future will determine the level of income the Scottish Government will receive from these assets. And in future, under the proposed legislation, Crown Estate Managers, as well as delivering an income to the Scottish Government, may also be expected to deliver additional benefits, including contributing to sustainable development, delivering on economic regeneration, as well as delivering on social and environmental well-being. And it is also important to note that the bill will also allow for management of assets to be devolved to local authorities and other community groups and bodies. And Scottish Conservatives welcome this further devolution of the management and transfer of assets. Always provided that these potential new managers and owners have a full understanding of the obligations and responsibilities such transfers require. However, landlocked local authorities must not lose out in the benefits of the seas simply because they do not have a coastline. Local authorities such as South and North Lanarkshire and East Renfrewshire. However, and in addition, ambition alone will not be sufficient for such transfers to local authorities and communities. And any application to either manage or own assets currently under the care of Crown Estate Scotland must be subject to a strong business case being presented and must be subject to due diligence being carried out by Scottish ministers. In addition, any such proposal must also be subject to Scottish ministers assuring themselves that those who wish to embark on managing or owning Crown Estate assets have a full understanding of the actual and potential risks and liabilities attached to their proposals. And in this regard, Scottish Conservatives also have concerns that the transfer of assets and that the transfer of the management of assets from the Crown Estate Scotland could lead to fragmentation of the Crown Estate Scotland and the loss of expertise within the Crown Estate itself. And self-evidently, the more assets that are transferred from the Crown Estate, the harder it will be for the Crown Estate Scotland to provide income to the Scottish Government and a balance will need to be struck and understanding reached between the Scottish Government, Crown Estate managers and interested third parties on the cost to the Scottish Government of transferring assets out of the current management structure. Further, the more assets that are transferred from the Crown Estates, the harder it will be for cross-subsidisation between different parts of the estate if the size of the portfolio of the whole estate is reducing year on year. 
In addition, if the portfolio of assets are reduced on a regular basis, not only will the income due to the Scottish Government reduce, but the 9% investment income will reduce too. Turning now to land management issues specifically, Scottish Conservatives fully support the view of the STFA, the NFUS, and the tenants themselves that the national management of the four rural estates should be continued through Crown Estate Scotland. In principle, of course, this should not be subject to ministerial micromanagement and interference, and that is why it is important to be clear from the outset in terms of what is on the face of the bill and in terms of the guidance issued what the remit of the Crown Estate Scotland will be in this regard. In practice, however, the temptation for ministers to interfere and the pressure on them to intervene in the day-to-day -day running of the Crown Estate Scotland will be huge. And a perfect illustration of this is the proposed sale of, of Ochenholrig Farm, part of the Fockabers Estate by Crown Estate Scotland. Clearly, the proposed sale of Auchin Hall Rig by Crown Estate Scotland is in their view for sound business reasons and for the benefit of the estates as a whole, yet the STFA are seeking to stop this sale as it will further reduce the dwindling support of the dwindling amount of tenanted land available to incoming tenants across Scotland. And while this is just an early example of the difficulties Scottish Government ministers will be under pressure to intervene on, the proposed new criteria that Crown Estate land managers will have to work under will only make the pressure for ministerial intervention even greater as we move away from the delivery of revenue to the Treasury as the sole measure of success of Crown Estate Scotland and towards the delivery of sustainability, social and mental well-being and economic regeneration as well. Minister, a whole new lobbying industry <laughs> is probably about to be born that will seek to spend the revenues the government had hoped to receive from Crown Estate Scotland and the need for clear direction on the face of the bill and guidance in place from day one could not be more important to the managers of the Crown Estate Scotland if, in one second, if they are to provide a reasonable yield on their assets to the Scottish Government in the face of the much greater expectations to be placed on them. Very briefly, please. Alex Rowley. Forgive me, I appreciate that there may be a new lobbying industry, but do you think there's an opportunity for tenants themselves to have a greater say? Always through the chair, please, Mr Rowley. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Yes, I do, I did, and I think it's working well at the moment, and I'm pleased with the recent improvements in that regard in the Tenants Forum that's been set up. But turning now to other assets of the Crown Estate Scotland, Scottish Conservatives share the view of the committee that the seabed should not be sold off, except perhaps in the most exceptional circumstances. That's just my own view. And we would urge the government to address this at stage two. We would also recommend the retention within Crown Estate Scotland of the expertise to deal with offshore wind applications particularly and offshore energy and renewable energy applications generally. Scottish Conservatives believe there is a significant and valuable body of knowledge within the Crown Estate staff that is at risk of being dispersed if too many assets are transferred from Crown Estates to local authorities and community groups, and the loss of such expert knowledge could reduce the critical mass of the management team that is vital for good decision making. Turning now to communities, the, com the no, committee. You'll, you'll have to close very quickly, right. please, Mr. Um, Okay, uh, so uh, I will conclude by welcoming this bill, which we will support at decision time and seek to improve on it at stage two. Thank you. I call Claudia Beamish for up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Scottish Labour supports the principle of the Crown Estates Bill today. However, there are some aspects of the bill which we would like to highlight some concerns about as we proceed to stage two. And I also intend to reflect the recommendations of my committee, uh, the Eclair Committee, building on the comments of our convener, Graham Day. The Law Society of Scotland, in their briefing, rightly highlights, I quote, the need for full transparency and accountability in relation to the management of the estate. And RSPB briefing stresses this is a step change. While both might seem obvious comments, they are at the core of the future of the devolved Crown Estates, a move Scottish Labour heartily welcomes. 
I have long argued, along with others, for the mission of the Crown Estates to have a social remit, and indeed an environmental one, setting sustainable development at its heart. Now, as a Parliament through this Bill, devolving the powers and setting out the governance arrangements, we have the opportunity to enshrine this inclusive and empowering way forward in statute. The Bill does seek to enshrine the principles of good management for the Crown Estate. Today, I ask the question of the Cabinet Secretary, indeed, I wish the, the actual Cabinet Secretary, not the actual Cabinet Secretary, but the Cabinet Secretary for Environment well, but, and perhaps she could reply to that um, when better, but what are the criteria for good management of a public asset in the 21st century? Scottish Labour are pushing to strengthen the principles looking to place an obligation on managers to take account of enhancing regeneration, social well-being, environmental well-being and sustainable development in parallel with the obligations of finan for financial returns. Thus, managers could be required to consider and report on how they take into account issues beyond financial ones. In my view, the most straightforward way to do this would be to change may to must in clause 7b, but then I'm not a lawyer. The, e the Eclair Committee also, I quote, felt that the Scottish Government should consider rewording the duty in this clause, in this section, uh, for uh, decision makers when deciding how an asset should be managed. And further, it, we believe that it should be the case that even if such consideration leads to a conclusion that the factor may not be relevant, it should still be taken into account. The Cabinet Secretary has recognised this concern and I'm pleased she will consider it carefully. Uh, and while Scottish Labour recognises the national significance of the Crown Estates of Scotland, this should in no way prevent further devolution taking place. Two local authorities, and particularly island authorities, though not exclusively, uh, as highlighted in the Smith, by the Smith Commission. And there must be a process for this, whether it be Highland Council, Orkney Island Council, or any other council. But we wish them well in that process, um, if and when the bill passes. Uh, Cosler's Economy and Environment Councillor Stephen Heddle states, paragraph 8 is at the start of the section entitled Local versus National Management. It is worth stating, he goes on, that we do not view the future of the Crown Estate in such binary terms. Much like Scottish G devolution, we view the devolution of the Crown Estate as an evolving process which can change over time. I, like other members who have spoken, uh, now turn to the national asset of the seabed and the, the ownership of this. It is indeed a challenge and our committee, the Eclair Committee, has said that there should be only in very rare circumstances any sale of the seabed. And the Scottish Government um, will consider Scot uh, our recommendations um, for amendments to ensure it cannot be sold. Uh, I think that, yes, I'm just going to finish that. A little bit. I think there should be more consideration of this, just a little bit more consideration before stage two. Yeah. Edward Mountain. Uh, I'd like to thank the member for taking the intervention. I mean, I, I take the point about the sale of uh, seabed, but there is also a concern of very long leases on the seabed, which may not have break clauses in them. Does the member share my concerns on that issue? Claudia Beamish. Uh, it's not something I've considered before now in terms of break clauses, but um, if there are long leases, um, there should be very clear criteria as to appropriate management, as with um, all the rest of the, um, of the arrangements for, um, for de devolution of management. So um, I, I, I would like to turn to the issue of community managers um, and the argument which was put forward by our committee and which Scottish Labour supports that community managers should have support where necessary. Although let's not assume simply because they are community organisations that they will need more or less management than any other managers. Um, we concur with the committee in Scottish Labour, which I quote, believes that the current definition of community organisation in the bill, uh, based around geographical factors alone, um, and it does not encompass communities of interest. And this is a concern uh, in relation to the bill. Um, uh, the committee uh, are asking and saying that it would find it helpful if it could be in line with the similar uh, provisions in the Community Empowerment Act, Scotland, uh, 2015. And the committee recommends that the Scottish Government reconsider its definition of community ahead of stage two. And I look forward to hearing from the Cabinet Secretary on this after 
um, his or indeed her reflection. Community ownership consideration in the bill is a significant issue in, in terms of Scottish Labour's view, in view of the unjust patterns of ownership which still continue intractably today in Scotland, and enabling communities to have ownership of some particular assets which allow them the autonom autonomy and democratic process when they're community landowners to shape how these assets are used in practice you should must not come be ruled to close, out. Please. Yes, I will. Thank you. I do grasp there is a need to avoid fragmentation, though, of the Crown Estates, and my colleague Collins uh, Smith will um, go into some detail about tenant farmers who indeed also need protected. As I said, we support the principles of the Bill. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Andy Whiteman for around four minutes, please. Sir, a historic moment as Parliament debates legislation on the Crown Estate. For the best part of 40 years, there's been an active campaign to eliminate the malign influence of the Crown Estate Commissioners by, for example, the West Highland Free Press and politicians such as Brian Wilson and Michael Foxley. And I particularly like to commend the Crown Estate Review Working Group, who reported in 2006 uh, a report from seven local authorities and COSLA, which brought this issue to public attention. Uh, the estate comprises a range of Crown property rights, and they are an intrinsic part of Scotland's system of land tenure, as well as other conventional modern property acquisitions. And historically, these rights were always administered in Scotland until the 1830s, when control went south, leaving only Bona Vacantia, Ultima Aires, and Treasure Trove, which to this day are administered by the Crown Office, with revenues paid to the Scottish Consolidated Fund. It's important... Point of order from John Scott. Officer, is it parliamentary language to use the word malign in the description of Crown Estate officers who have been only and absolutely properly discharging their duties entirely within the law and the remit and doing that job extremely well. Is the use of the word malign parliamentary language unreasonable? I have to say to you, Mr Scott, um, that I will make sure that we look carefully at the official report, although it is the responsibility of members uh, what they say in the chamber. I didn't hear the phrase very clearly. No offence to Mr Whiteman, I wasn't listening closely at that point, uh, but I will consider that and come back to you on it. Please continue, Mr Whiteman. Thank you. Uh, it's important to note two substantive things. Firstly, Crown property rights and interests in Scotland have, for centuries, been defined by Scots law, and they remain so. And secondly, for most of their history, they've been administered here in Scotland and the revenues flowed to the Scottish Exchequer with only a short hiatus between 1830 and 2017. They never, for example, formed part of the civil list when England's crown revenues were surrendered in 1760. In other words, this is a distinctive historic set of rights that belong to Scotland. Attempts to devolve the powers in 1998 were blocked by the Treasury and the Palace with only the crown's property rights and the crown prerogative included in the Scotland Act. In 2014, the Smith Commission recommended that management and revenues be devolved. Despite UK guarantees that Smith would be implemented in full, legislative competence, competence for the revenues of the Crown Estate was never devolved as it should have been. Presiding officer, the bill proceeds on the assumption that the Crown Estate is a coherent suite of assets, which by law must be maintained as, as an estate on, in land on behalf of the Crown. Greens reject this assumption. The Crown Estate is a feudal relic. It is an ad hoc assembly of rights, including everything from gold and silver, a lock-up garage in the new town and the island of Rockall. Our goal should be to sweep away this anachronism and not to perpetuate it within the framework of complicated management and delegation powers. Put simply, Scotland's ancient Crown property, the Regalia Majora and Minora, should be abolished and the rights converted or transferred as appropriate to other legal bodies. For example, despite the transfer of administration in 2014, there's no good reason why the medieval right of Scottish Crown to naturally occurring mussels and oysters has any place in a modern statute book, and the bill should abolish this right, confirming the species as ferry naturi, wild animals. More substantially, the Crown's right to the foreshore should be abolished. As the Scottish Law Commission notes in its 2001 discussion paper on the foreshore and the seabed, the Crown's right to the foreshore are a patrimonial right derived from the Crown prerogative. Though even this is, in the words of the Commission, merely, and I quote, the predominant modern theory. The Bill provides the opportunity to modernise the legal basis for the ownership of the foreshore, to abolish the Crown's rights, and to vest title in Scotland's local authorities, rather than through a complicated scheme of delegated management. Similarly, for the seabed, where the Crown's ownership has no statutory basis, this Bill could vest it in the name of Scottish ministers, and create an equivalent to the National Forest Land Scheme to enable transfers of title to Scotland's 248 
local authority harbours and 46 trust ports, ending decades of legal disputes and conflict. Finally, the Smith Commission recommended the responsibility of management of Crown property be further devolved to local authorities. The bill makes provision for regulations to enable this, but contains no statutory right. We will table amendments to make it clear that this transfer is a statutory right subject only to due process. Greens were elected to build, bring bold and transformative ideas to Holyrood. The Crown Estate is a perfect uh, example no, of where this is needed. To, Thank close. you. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Uh, I now call Tavish Scott for up to five minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. It is a good uh, step that this Parliament has taken the powers of the Crown Estate, but I'm with Andy Whiteman. I am for a much more radical approach to this organisation. I'll give two further examples to John Scott as to why we should do an awful lot more, an awful lot more than just go to a complicated, and the Minister was right, an incredibly complicated uh, and highly technical approach to sorting out these uh, issues. Uh, the, uh, when a port, a trust port, uh, decides to extend a key or deepen a navigation channel uh, across uh, in any of the ports around uh, Scotland. What does the Crown Estate do for that? They charge for it. So they own the asset. Do they invest in it? No, they don't. Does the trust port invest in it? Yes, they do. They deepen the navigation channel because of bigger shipping uh, or they reclaim land in order to improve the key space. And they then pay for the privilege of improving the asset that is owned by the Crown Estate. Uh, one further example, Mr Scott, if you doubt the need for radical reform uh, in this area. Uh, when I was handling uh, some of this in a previous job uh, back in uh, Shetland, of course, the Crown Estate passed to councils the job of handling applications for licensing licenses for aquaculture developments. Uh, they then took the rental income. So we did the work and they took the rental income. So the need for reform here is very considerable indeed. I want to speak to the CBEN in particular. I take the points that uh, other members may mention this afternoon in terms of farm tenants and, and others uh, in terms of the uh, Crown Estate assets on land. But in terms of the seabed inside 12 miles, and there is an argument for uh, water outside 12 miles as well, there is a need for a much uh, stronger uh, devolved approach to this, a different approach uh, for Scotland based on the assets that are there. And here's why. It is in uh, Stephen Heddle's letter uh, that uh, was set out uh, by Claudia Beamish uh, earlier sets out a coherent case uh, why island authorities and others, if they so wish it, should take these responsibilities. And it's between that, uh, th that uh, local versus national uh, management. Uh, the logic of the argument which says it must all be done nationally is that Shetland's Council could never have run the Sulemvo oil terminal. Forty years of running the Sulemvo oil terminal. Uh, what did we deal with? The Esso Benicia, when in 1978 she spilt, uh, that particular tanker spilt oil in the confines of uh, the Sulemvo uh, Vo, uh, we had to put in place uh, pollution prevention measures and a, what became a gold standard in terms of dealing with oil spills. I don't remember anyone at that stage saying that we should sweep these powers away and have them all run by a quango uh, down. If Edward Manton wants to intervene, he's welcome to, but stop just telling me I'm wrong from, the, from where I'm sitting. Uh, Edward Mountain. I'm not telling you you're wrong. And, and I, Through I the chair, please, Mr. That. Mountain. Sorry, uh, presiding officer, I wouldn't tell a member he's wrong. I just wondered if it's exactly the same law on the islands. Uh, regarding in Shetland and Orkney as it is in the rest of Scotland regarding the seabed and the coastline. And perhaps a member could clarify that for me and other members. It might be helpful. Well, I'm not going to get into Udall Law, though uh, Andy Whiteman and Stuart Stevens and I might have a debate about that, but not uh, here and in this day. Although there is an interesting question that uh, does need to be teased out uh, by our learned friends in the, in the benches. So if that's the point that Mr Mountain was making, he'll forgive me for not mentioning uh, that specific point uh, here uh, today. My point is about local versus national uh, management. Shetland's Council and other local authorities uh, in, uh, who have particular marine responsibilities have been doing what we now call marine spatial planning, what government now calls the Marine Act, uh, for a lot longer than ever uh, that this place was thinking about marine acts. Uh, so uh, the central contention that local government cannot be innovative uh, and cannot come up with the right solutions uh, to take these paths and move them on and uh, uh, enable them uh, to drive forward sustainable economic development in, in uh, island and coastal communities, I do not ex uh, accept, and I think that is why we need a much, more, a much stronger approach to this, which is the epitome of what the Smith Commission discussed. Uh, in that week uh, that was uh, a week I will never get back in my life, uh, when we discussed um, everything about the devolved powers of this place, the, one of the few areas where there was absolutely 
absolute agreement across all the political parties was in the need for real change on this, for the, for the, powers, of the uh, powers of the Crown to be a state to be devolved to this Parliament and for then for us to make decisions. But we must get that right. So on the specific point that was mentioned about never selling anything, I could not disagree uh, more. And here's why. Trust ports have been able to do that in terms of small parcels for many, many a year. And if, if some members in here think that is something you should take away from trust ports, you are reinstating the worst kind of management we dealt with from London for decades after decades after decades. And go and ask any trust port are all around the coast of Scotland. That is not the right approach. And it is not right that we replicate the management that we did not care for from London with a management in Edinburgh, which would do exactly the same thing. So I hope that um, the committee members who took, I don't know what evidence they took on that, but uh, what they do need to do is reflect on uh, a measure uh, which is about the sustainable development of trust ports across Scotland, and that included a sensible ability to purchase small areas of seabed under a pier after they had invested the money in order to do that. So there's much that needs to be done here. There's much good in this bill, but we shouldn't get bogged down. I think the minister made a fair point. We shouldn't get bogged down in highly difficult technical details and constructions of systems, we should do some of the radical things we should do to shake this right up. We now move to the open debate. Uh, time is quite tight, uh, so speeches of no more than five minutes, please. Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Peter Chapman. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and I draw members' attention to my small registered agricultural holding. Um, and I, just in response to uh, a little thing that's just been said by Tavish Scott, um, I can't find it in the bill, but I know it's there, um, that uh, it is possible to sell assets provided the proceeds are then used to purchase another heritable asset. So, uh, but that may not be a complete answer to the point he made. I'm, I'm just going to respond to the invitation that this is a technical bill by making a few technical points that are beyond what the committees uh, looked at. Uh, in particular, at uh, section 62A, um, which requires that uh, a body uh, that takes over the management has to have no fewer than 20 members. I just invite uh, the government to have a wee think about that and build some flexibility. And I'm just thinking in particular of the recent buyout at Ulva, where the consent was required of a large number of people who were not on Ulva because of the way the community was defined. And it might be that there are similar circumstances in future. So I'd, I, I'm going to make progress if you don't mind. Um, the, 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 the other thing, I just want to make a few points about uh, uh, finance. Uh, one of the things is that managers of assets to whom it's been devolved, acting on local communities, um, are allowed, of course, to have other interests. They have to keep the accounts separate uh, for uh, the Crown Estate asset from any other assets they may have, and that's perfectly proper provision. However, uh, it may well be that the aggregation of an asset which comes from the Crown Estate with one which does not from come into the state adds additional value to the value of the two assets. So I think there's an unresolved question in the bill as it's currently drafted uh, as to how you then divide the income uh, and liability. And speaking of which, uh, if we go to section 34A, uh, which relates to a transferee ceasing to exist, the function in any rights or liabilities uh, transferred to the transferee. And I just think there's a wee bit of an awkward construct there in relation to liabilities when a community organisation might become insolvent. They will be very likely to be registered under the Companies Act and therefore there will be provision for insolvency. It would be very unusual for the liabilities not to be extinguished at the point of insolvency rather than for us to legislate that they be transferred to someone else. And I think there's a degree of irresponsibility could, in some very unlikely circumstances, come in where actually liabilities never rest upon the shoulders of those for whom uh, who have been responsible for them. So I invite ministers to have uh, a wee think about that. Uh, looking at section 14, which uh, limits uh, the, 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 the granting of a lease to a period of 150 years, slightly odd uh, choice of uh, 150 years, the Long Leases Act of 2012 uh, has 175 years. I, Mr. Whiteman in particular will remember as, as minister I worked with him on that subject. Um, and of course, a, I heard Edward Mountain refer to long leases of the seabed. If they're over 175 years, then of course the Long Leases Act converted them to ownership 
uh, rather than being a lease. And I just post that as a little interesting thing because I don't know if uh, that is the case in any cases. Primarily, uh, presiding officer, um, I want to see devolution in relation to uh, Crown Estate assets work to the maximum degree that it can. Uh, I'm less interested in local authorities taking responsibility, although clearly there are areas where that is the appropriate thing. And I think the success of uh, what we're doing here will depend on our getting good, effective devolution down to quite small communities for whom the devolution may make a very uh, substantial uh, difference. Now, the bill is uh, silent uh, on the, 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 the issue of, uh, relatively silent on the issue of community. And I think there is some advantage in that because the overbuy illustrates that the, the, while we were able to make it work, that the land reform provision for community buyouts kind of worked in a very odd way because only a tiny minority of those who had to give permission uh, were actually an over. And I think it's uh, uh, worth looking at that. Finally, presiding officer, um, I look at recommendation 342, which is about up-to-date assessments of the condition of Crown Estates in Scotland and the absence of that, which the committee draws attention to. I, I welcome the fact that that's now being remedied uh, because lack of knowledge of your assets is the road to economic and financial uh, uh, perdition. I wish this bill every success, presiding officer. Thank you. I call Peter Chapman, followed by Richard Lockhead. Mr Chapman, please. I thank you, presiding officer, and I will firstly declare an interest as a partner in the farming business as well. And let me start by saying I'm pleased to be involved in this debate today on what is an important piece of legislation. Now, this legislation follows from the Smith Commission recommendations in the Scotland Act 2016. And this act was delivered by a Conservative government, which allows the devolution of the management of the Crown Estate to the Scottish Parliament. Quickly. A big heavy sigh, but yes, he will, Mr Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the member agree, though, that contrary to what the Smith Commission recommended in devolving the management and the revenues, the revenues under Schedule 5, Section 233A remain reserved? Peter Chapman. I've got to bow to the, the member's superior knowledge. I, I, I can't comment because I really don't know, to be honest. Now, the Crown Estate, we are broadly in support of the Clare Committee recommendations in this report. The Crown Estate in Scotland comprises a wide range of assets. This includes rural estates, rights to fish wild salmon and sea trout in river and coastal areas, rights to naturally occurring gold and silver across most of Scotland, some moorings, ports and harbours, the seabed out to 12 nautical miles, the rights to offshore renewable energy and gas out to 200 nautical miles, and business property in Edinburgh. And this bill allows for further development, de devolvement of management of powers to local authorities, public bodies, and community organisations. Now, the Clare Committee is of the opinion that although powers may be further devolved, some assets should remain under national management. Now, the Scottish Government, I believe, needs to make clear which assets must be retained under national control and those which may be devolved to a local level. My concern is that the, the devolvement process may lead to the wholesale fragmentation of the estate, and I believe if that were to happen, that would be a mistake. Crown Estate Scotland tenants are generally happy with how the Crown Estate is being run during this transition phase. Tenants report that devolution has brought significant benefits, including a connectivity with the estate, improved communications and more involvement in decision making. The bill also provides for a number of mechanisms which are designed to provide transparency and accountability in the management of assets. However, I think more needs to be done within the bill to provide clarity on how suitable, able and knowledgeable those applying to manage assets actually are. A further issue is that whilst the policy of operating cross subsidies across different assets works well at present, there is the potential for this to become more complex once assets are devolved to a local level. I endorse the Clare Committee's concern about the lack of financial flexibility contained within the bill. I agree that there are significant benefits in Crown Estate Scotland having the ability to hold capital reserves for strategic investment and to retain revenue to service capital expenditure. And the historic figure of 9% of gross revenue that can be retained 
I believe needs to be reassessed. Agricultural tenancies should remain centrally managed, reflecting the wishes of the tenant farmer. Tenants are concerned that local authorities may, uh, may take control of the agricultural holdings of the Crown Estate. We are also concerned with this view and recognise that the Crown Estate is seen as an excellent example of a landlord which works well with its tenants and is prepared to offer long-term stable tenancies and invest in its farms for the long-term good of the estate. I don't think I have time, sorry. There is also the possibility that new young entrants into farming might be offered subsidised rents for an initial period to allow them a start and national management is therefore vitally important. That is what the tenants wish to see happen, and I think it must be what happens in the long term. The bill is also clear that asset must be managed in a way that leads to sustainable development. This means that factors such as social and environmental well-being, as well as profitability, must be taken into account in all management decisions. And we on this side of the chamber recommend a measured approach to how island communities and island local authorities are dealt with in the process of devolving management powers. The island bill just passed by this parliament has raised expectation and island authorities may, well, may be well placed to take on the management of assets around their coasts. And so I believe pilot schemes should be put in place as soon as possible to allow this to happen. In conclusion, presiding officer, we are broadly supportive of this bill at stage one, and I look forward to opportunities to strengthen and fine-tune it as it makes its way through the process. Thank you very much. Involved. I call Richard Lockhead to be followed by Colin Smith. Mr Lockhead, please. Uh, thank you very much. I've welcomed this debate and thank the committee for their stage one report as well and all the effort put in by the Scottish Government and all the campaigners down the years to achieve the devolution of the Crown Estate. According to the Scottish Parliament Information Centre's briefing, uh, this has been a long journey. It's taken us 952 years to get here. So I understand the impatience of those who want to get everything right in the first day of devolution. But according to the briefing note, the Crown State as a whole dates back to 1066. And since 1760, the net income of the Crown State has been transferred to Exchequer under successive, successive civil list acts. So it has been indeed a long journey getting here. Uh, and we should celebrate that... Uh, we're here, but of course we're now 19 years into devolution, so again, it's been a lot longer than many of us expected, especially those of us who've been involved in this debate for, for many, many years. Uh, <clears throat> I recall a few years ago when we finally managed to persuade the Crown Estate to come to committees in the Parliament, where they gave some bare outline financial figures, but there wasn't a lot of transparency. But at that time, a few years ago, that was seen as a breakthrough, because for so many years, literally the 952 years, there has been no transparency. And of course, the debate has been around the fact that our natural assets should be used for the benefit of the people of Scotland, particularly the communities uh, closest to them, uh, and that we should not have our tenant farmers working their socks off or other assets in terms of more tangible assets being used to generate net revenues to go to the UK Exchequer in London. So we are now much further forward and there is now huge potential to make sure that our natural assets work for uh, the benefit of our local communities and the Scottish national interest. In my own constituency, of course, of Murray, I have got a long-standing interest because I have the uh, Falkabers and Glenlivet Estates. I also have the coastline with the Murray Firth. I have fishing rights in the rivers and so on. I've got other assets such as the harbour, uh, which is owned by the Crown State uh, in Port Gordon. So our local communities for a long time in Murray have been calling for change with the Crown Estate. And they very much welcome the devolution of the Crown Estate. And the key now, of course, is to show that things are different. And it is fantastic that we now have a new remit for the Scottish Crown Estate and the Bill of Economic Development, Regeneration, Social Wellbeing, Environmental Wellbeing and Sustainable Development as well. So whilst we have to address that balance between continuity and change because we want to show that things are different, we do need some element of continuity because in the case of the tenant farmers, for instance, in the farm estates in my constituency, they very much want to ensure that we get the benefits of devolution, but that the Crown Estate as a whole continues to benefit the ability to invest in the many tenant farms in Murray and that the Crown Estate has throughout the whole of Scotland. So we have to strike that very careful balance. And I, I am pleased that the, the committee report recognises that in terms of the division between what should be managed nationally and what should be managed locally. 
Now, there are many issues that should be managed locally. I met the Fintorn Village Conservation Company, who have now taken over land through an award from the Land Fund uh, in Fintorn, and they were reminding me just yesterday, actually, when I met them, that Fintorn Bay has mooring fees that go to the Crown Estate, but, of course, they would like these mooring fees to come to help support the local community in Fintorn. So there's a strong case for the further devolution of management of the assets in some areas, but for other assets, such as our tenant farms and the farm estates, to be managed nationally. And I know my local tenant farmers are loath at the idea that the Murray Council or our, a more local body should take control, because that raises all kinds of issues for the viability of these estates in the years ahead. And that takes us into another key tension, which is how we have cross subsidisation at the same time as the ability to uh, allow local communities to take control of some assets that generate revenues for the overall Crown Estate. Now, of course, if there was a fragmentation of those assets, that would make that very, very difficult in the years ahead. So I do agree with the Scottish Government to take a rather cautious approach as we move forward with some of these tensions and these debates. Because if we saw the fragmentation of the Crown Estate's assets, then there would not be able to be that cross-subsidy. And that would lead to some financial issues and viability issues for the tenant farms in particular, but other assets. But we have to have that balance. People want to know things are different. We want to know that the Crown Estate is going to be much more responsive to local needs, to work with local needs. I would like to see uh, the Scottish Crown Estate given the ability to have joint ventures and more commercial operations. And I'm pleased the Stage 1 report addresses that as well. I also want to address the fact that I remember during the debate over the devolution of the Crown Estate um, that we couldn't persuade the UK Government to give the Fort Cairnard um, assets to uh, Scotland under devolution. I also note that just last week it's been reported in the media that the Crown Estate, this is not the Scottish Crown Estate, this is the Crown Estate as in the rest of the UK, who refused to devolve this asset despite the fact it's in Scotland, which was an absolute scandal, has been sold for £167.3 million to M&G Real Estate. So now we know why the UK would not devolve that to Scotland. I'm afraid they want you must conclude. Out that £167 million. But I wish the government well and consult Thank you. the communities moving Colin forward. Colin Smith, followed by Angus Macdonald. <coughs> Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to speak in today's debate, which paves the way for another of the Smith Commission recommendations to be delivered. I'd like to, to commend the work of members of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee in scrutinising this bill. There's a great deal to welcome here, and I'm happy to support the general principles of the bill. One of the important themes to come from the, the Smith Commission was that the view that devolution cannot just be about powers transferring from one parliament to another. It must also be about devolving powers to our local councils and communities. This bill is an opportunity to halt the centralising drift we have seen in Scotland in recent years, to enact the view of the Smith Commission that the management of the Crown Estate assets in Scotland should be devolved as far as possible to our local communities. As the Clare Committee's report notes, local communities have unique local knowledge, are motivated to ensure the continued success of an asset and are likely to have imaginative ideas about how to develop that asset further in the future. This bill makes that the welcome provision for both local authorities and community organisations to be managers. However, there remains a lack of clarity in what this means in practice. I therefore support the committee's view that the Scottish Government should clearly outline which assets it anticipates will continue to be managed on a national basis and which can be devolved to a local level. In their submission to the committee, Orkney Islands Council rightly stated that the bill, as currently drafted, does not sufficiently deliver on the recommendations of the Smith Commission and should go further. The Scottish Government must listen to those local authorities and communities and respond to those concerns. And it's not enough to simply give groups the legal capability to manage assets. They must be equipped with the support and guidance needed to be able to do so in practice. In their submission to the committee, the Law Society of Scotland emphasised that community organisations will require access to professional advice and planning in order to properly manage assets. Likewise, the Clear Committee's report recognised that ongoing advice and guidance will be vital in ensuring smaller community groups are able to successfully manage assets. Similarly, there must be safeguards added to ensure tenant farmers are not put at a disadvantage and steps taken to improve the standard and consistency of support they receive. I agree with the committee's recommendation that priority should be given to repairs to accommodation for tenant farmers and to their families. This must be funded sustainably, however. In recent weeks, we have seen the Crown Estate selling off tenanted farms to fund investment, while other public agencies are looking for land to help young people make a start in farming. And I appreciate there are financial challenges facing Crown Estate Scotland, but selling off tenanted farms to fund other investment is a short-term unsustainable fix. 
But as well as looking at who is managing assets, we must consider how they are run. I am glad the Bill seeks to expand the objectives of those managing the state to include other considerations, namely economic development, regeneration, social well-being, environmental well-being and sustainable development. This broadened remit is a welcome improvement. However, this provision needs to be strengthened. Under the current wording of the Bill, managers must seek to enhance the value and profitability of assets, but may do so in a way that promotes these other objectives, meaning there is no real requirement for these aims to be given any consideration. In their submission to the committee, Highlands and Islands Enterprise expressed concerns that the current wording may make it very difficult, if not impossible, for managers to take account of the wider benefits. Similarly, Professors Ross and Reid of Dundee University stated that the provision gives undue pre-eminence to pursuing economic interests over other concerns. The reality is other considerations will be consistently overlooked in favour of profitability if this provision is not strengthened, a point I am pleased the Government recognises in their response to the Clear Committee's report. Related to this is the need to, to more clearly define what constitutes good management of Crown Estate assets. I support the Clear Committee's recommendation that a definition reflecting the wider public objectives, including socio-economic, environmental and sustainable development considerations, should be set out. So I am disappointed the Government have indicated they do not plan to include such a definition in the Bill, and I hope, at the very least, they will commit to including one in the guidance. Moving forward, the transitionary period will create uncertainty for existing Crown Estate Scotland staff. I would like to echo the Clear Committee's recommendation that staff should be provided with a realistic indication of how their role might change or not as a result of the Bill and be meaningfully consulted and engaged in planning processes both now and following the passage of the Bill. I am pleased to see the Government provide a positive response to these recommendations in their reply, and I hope this means full and proper discussions with the relevant trade unions. Presiding officer, in conclusion, I am happy to support the general principles of the bill today, but I hope that the points raised by the two committees and by members across the chamber today will be taken on board by the government, and I look forward to seeing more detail and indeed amendments on the plans as this bill moves forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I call Angus Macdonald to be followed by Edward Mount. And Mr. Macdonald, please. Thank you, President Officer. As a member of the committee, I am pleased to be speaking in today's Stage 1 debate, not least because the bill is a welcome step forward uh, with regard to previous work. Uh, this Parliament has done on community empowerment. However, before I, I do go on to speak about the report itself, I'd just like to place on record my disappointment and frustration, along with my colleague uh, Richard Lockheads, that Edinburgh's Fort Caird retail park, which the Crown Estate has or had a 50% stake in, was not included in the transfer of Crown Estate Scotland, uh, transfer to Crown Estate Scotland, despite calls from the Scottish Government in 2015 to the UK Government calling on the retail park to be devolved. Of course, we know that the UK government signalled it had no intention to do so. And two weeks ago, on the 7th of June, we found, exactly, we found out exactly why that was the case when it was announced that M&G Real Estate had acquired the Crown Estate's 50% stake in Fort Caird in a £167 million deal. Now, I can't help feeling a tad bitter about that, eh, not least because, as I understand it, that £167 million could have been used as cross-subsidisation of other CES assets such as the Glenlivet, Fochabers, uh, Applegarth and Whitehill Estates. And I'm sure the tenant farmers on these four estates would have welcomed capital investment to improve their farm buildings and indeed their farm houses to ensure the farming units are fit for purpose to meet tenants' needs. As it stands, Crown Estate Scotland will see none of that £167 million. Another prime example, along with the convergence uplift money, which hasn't come to Scotland as it should have, of Scotland being shortchanged yet again. Perhaps if that hadn't been the case, there would have been no need for Crown Estate Scotland to consider selling off Auchenhaurig Farm on the Fochabers Estate with an asking price of over £1.6 million, removing land from the tenanted sector, which the Scottish Tenant Farmers Association has described, and I quote, as a grave error considering the scarcity of available land to let. And I understand the STFA has written to the Cabinet Secretary to that effect. So I'll go back to my original point that if one of the reasons for putting Auchenhaurig on the market is to raise the investment required to bring the buildings and fixed equipment up to tenantable condition, had the £167 million been available from the Fort Caird sale, it could have helped to avoid the sale of much needed tenanted land. However, we are where we are, President Officer, and I'm sure members can understand the frustration I feel that Crown Estate Scotland has been forced to sell off tenanted land when that could have been avoided if the UK Government had agreed to the transfer of the Fort Caird stake. Turning to the report itself, the sale of Auchenhaurig Farm to cross-subsidise other assets highlights the need for an audit of existing Crown Estate assets. 
The committee was surprised to hear there is no current up-to-date assessment of Crown Estate assets in Scotland. It is clear that uh, understanding the current state of assets and the cost involved in addressing any issues is vital to determining the value of the assets, associated liabilities, and is a necessary starting point for identifying a future programme of work and investment. So the committee has therefore recommended that the Bill makes specific provision for the creation of a record of condition of Scottish Crown Estate assets that identifies the cost to address issues and places a requirement on the Scottish Crown Estate to ensure the assets are properly maintained. Such an audit was warmly welcomed by tenants, however they were clear that this audit should be co-produced with them, including the, the design of the audit and not to be a top-down exercise with no input from tenants. This would help address a perception, and it would seem a valid one, that problems, some of them very long-standing, are often only picked up when reported by tenants and only then are they budgeted for. Uh, they suggested that planning uh, proactively now will help budget for better maintenance in the future, which uh, clearly makes sense to me. Um, the committee also recommends that the record of condition should be reviewed on a regular basis, as well as recommending that tenants must be involved in agreeing a schedule of works for repairs, and that priority should be given to repairs to accommodation for tenant farmers and their families, and agreed repairs should be carried out without unreasonable delay. The condition of tenant farmers' accommodation was an issue that came to light in the previous session of Parliament when the former RACI committee was taking evidence for the Land Reform Bill. So it would clearly be good if Crown Estate Scotland could lead by example in this regard, ensuring that dilapidated outbuildings and accommodation were made fit for purpose. And the committee uh, looks forward to amendments to address these issues coming forward at stage two. Uh, so, President Officer, um, I had hoped to touch on devolving the management of some Crown Estate Scotland assets to local authorities and community organisations, uh, particularly given it was a significant recommendation of the Smith Commission, but suffice to say, the inclusion of this in the Bill is very welcome. Uh, given that time constraints are on us, I'll leave it at that, President Officer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr MacDonald. I call Edward Mountain to be followed by Richard Lyle. Mr Lyle will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome today's Stage two, 1 debate on the Scottish Crown Estate Bill and join with my colleagues on these benches in supporting the legislation in principle. In our islands our and our future, and probably I should say, having said that, uh, I should actually declare an interest that I, do, I am a member of a farming partnership, before anyone corrects me. So I've declared that, and I'll move straight on to say, in, in our islands, our future campaign, Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles made a case for more local control of the Crown Estate. And this was evidence to me as a member of the REC Committee when I went to visit the islands. When the committee visited Orkney, the Western Isles, there was a general appetite for double devolution. Expectations on the islands are indeed high, with many islanders believing that the Scottish Crown Estate Bill, along with the Islands Bill, will empower island communities to allow them to assume control over the Crown Estate assets. However, I would caution the Scottish Government to think very carefully how it will enable double devolution to the islands without compromising the big picture. In particular, I believe they need to consider how and why the devolvement of, of the seabed to the three islands uh, councils can be done without comprehensive guidance. And unless that guidance is in there, it might not result in the best outcome. After all, the seabed is an asset which benefits all users, not just the islands. The Scottish Conservatives support double devolution to the islands in principle, but we are concerned about the dangers of fragmentation and there is to be more local control that must be accompanied with an overarching national policy that safeguards the assets which we believe are there. The last thing I would like to see is the complete breakup of the Scottish Crown Estates, with assets being either sold off or put out to long and irrevocable leases which we have no control over. Turning to the tenant farmers, it is clear to me that the tenant farmers on Glen, uh, Glen, uh, Glenlivet, Fockerbus, Applegarth and Whitehill are satisfied with the current arrangements established by the interim Crown Estate. The setting up of rural working groups has proved popular, with tenants feeling that the Crown Estate is now more accessible and responsive to local issues than it has ever been before. Tenants do want further devolution. So, yes, I will take an intervention. Claudia Beamish. Uh, I thank the member. And uh, does the member agree with me that it's very important that there is an equal opportunity 
opportunity for each of the four um, tenanted farms, the, the tenants on those farms, to have the same amount of repairs and maintenance, and that we shouldn't see what some would call um, the jewel in the crown of the Crown Estate, Glenlivet, as the one that um, gets more. Edward Mountain. I thank Claudia Beamish for that. I mean, I have to say, I know many of the tenant farmers on Glenlivet and at Focopus, and I know the standard of their uh, fixed equipment is extremely high. And sometimes I look at it with a green eye. I don't know the uh, state of the buildings on the uh, uh, other farms, but it is important that it's kept up to the required standard as laid down in the leases, and it's important that the government ensures that. Now, sorry, I think that uh, bearing in mind that that's taken up a bit of my time, I would just want to mention my concern that double devolution could lead to more managers, more costs, and, and less cohesion. And I really con am concerned about that. Now, I'd like to welcome uh, the, the fact that the Minister makes regarding devolution max. And it's not a one-size-that-fits-all solution. The fact that tenant farmers have found a solution that works for them, namely in a consultative approach with the Crown Estate Scotland, should be welcomed. Now, I just want to mention briefly, if I may, is the selling of uh, Ockham Hullrig Farm which has been mentioned by John Scott. Now, that removes an opportunity rather than creating one for young tenant farmers. There are young farmers across Scotland that are desperate for more tenancies to be made available. And the Scottish Government, in my mind, needs to reconsider whether it's appropriate to sell off the assets. Presiding officer, I would cautiously like to welcome the Scottish Crown Estates Bill at stage one. The real test of this bill will be to see how it turns out the recommendation of the Smith Commission into reality. And I urge the government to think very carefully how it might deliver devolution of the Crown Estate to the Three Islands Council. I would also urge the Scottish government not to sell the family silver, thus losing the assets that could work for the benefit of Scotland and the people within Scotland. Thank you. I call Richard Lyle, last speaker in the open debate. Move to closing speeches after that, Mr. Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. This bill provides for the devolution of the Scottish Crown Estate assets, including but not limited to rural estate, mineral, fishing rights, urban assets, the seabed and foreshore. I believe that this bill could be life-changing for many of our communities and should be supported. It will bring opportunities to communities and to local authorities. It will put local decision-making at the heart of this bill. This will ensure that many items which local communities felt were not being addressed will be. The bill will provide for other factors such as regeneration, social well-being, environmental well-being, sustainable development when considering how an asset should be managed. As a former councillor for many years, I see, this bill, I see in this bill the opportunity for local authorities, wherever possible, to participate in decision-making, read the management of assets in order to possibly increase revenues to Crown Estates and to deliver better outcomes for local people and the authority. And I am sure that this bill will be welcomed by all it affects. Many local councils that will be affected by this bill are better placed to discuss and support local communities, groups who wish to be involved in the future management of Crown Estates. I'm not suggesting for one moment that we cut up Crown Estates in order to satisfy certain groups, but that together local groups, local authorities and of course present managers look at the required future development in order to enhance assets. That, to me, is the operative word, enhance assets. This bill should be seen as a way to increase local development and to enhance asset base. The Eclair Committee has made various recommendations in this regard, and to my knowledge, it was supported by all committee members at that committee. And I am sure that the government will be, take on board the committee's primary object that the process for deciding which assets should be managed on a national basis and which can be devolved to a local level. I now turn to the, the question of cross-subsidy of assets. Under the present arrangement, some assets are more profitable than others. Therefore, it is the usual practice that some assets subsidise others. The bill does provide for transfer of assets from one manager to another, but we have to be mindful that there could be concern over overly fragmentation. If that became the case, the ability of one part to cross-subsidise another would be lost. I am sure that this matter will receive the attention it deserves as the Bill moves through its various stages. In fact, the Committee made various recommendations regarding this, including a recommendation that the Crown 
estates, establish and maintain a list of Crown estate assets and liabilities that attach to these facts. During the evidence sessions, I was struck by the way that the tenants are generally happy with the way that the Crown Estates is now being run. Tenants felt that devolution has brought significant benefits to them, including increased feeling of connectivity with the estate, improved communication and more involvement in decision-making processes. However, they did suggest that more work could be done on regular contact with factors, and many buildings in some estates require urgent maintenance. Tenants farmers feel that there are specific problems around the maintenance of rural buildings and the issues related to upkeep is not picked up early enough. This matter should be resolved. Buildings that are in a state of dilapidation, including outbuildings and, of course, accommodation for families, should be programmed for upgrading on an ongoing maintenance programme. In my opinion, tenants should be involved more locally, whether an asset is controlled or run by Crown Estates, local council or local community groups. Each has to play their part in local development of assets in order to improve for the benefit of all. Turning to the fact of offshore renewables-related assets, I note that Scottish renew renewables was clear that some assets were required to be managed on a national basis, particularly with large commercial offshore wind farms. I am sure this fact will be taken into consideration. In the report, the committee was of view that the seabed is a national asset and should be managed nationally and the seabed should not be sold. There was also discussion regarding the role of ports and harbour authorities in the concept of the bill. Particularly, Lerwick Port Authority suggested there is a need to ensure that the bill, the bill, bill does not encroach or permit to encroach on the jurisdiction established by the legislation of trust ports for the statutory harbours for which they are responsible. And I note the committee was mindful of the potential of the conflicts of interest to arise, and I'm sure the fact will be taken into consideration. In closing, President Officer, I believe this bill will be an opportunity to improve devolution to local communities, and I welcome it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Lyle. I move to closing speeches, though I'm disappointed Mr Stevenson has not graced us with his um, presence for the closing speeches. I call on Mark Ruskell. Three minutes, please, Mr Ruskell. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, Andy Whiteman was right when he described the Crown Estate as a feudal relic. It is the most surreal uh, of monopoly boards involving gold and mussels and the seabed and even that missing shopping centre which has now been sold off by the Westminster government. And I think it's important that we go back to the origins of this bill, the purpose of this bill. And I think Tavish Scott spoke very passionately and from the experience of the communities he represents in Shetland about the need for local democratic control of these public assets which have to be run in the public interest in an accountable way. And Councillor Heddle uh, from COSA has been quoted by a number of members in this debate this afternoon. And I'll, I'll quote from his uh, letter as well, where he says that, like the original Scotland Act, to be a success, the bill will require a deliberate decision by legislators to devolve as much as possible and also to leave the door open to future devolution where circumstances change. It's important that we're deliberate in ensuring that local authorities and communities get the best chance to move towards a new management going forward, which is in that public interest. In that regard, I believe it's important that there is a presumption in favour of communities and councils managing these Crown estate assets and that this will need to be looked at again at stage two. Um, a number of members have mentioned about sustainable development. Claudia Beamish in particular asked the question, what are the, the criteria for good management? That's absolutely about sustainable development. It's absolutely about ensuring that the livelihoods of future generations are protected because we're protecting the environment that that economy is based on. We should be looking for win-wins, growing the economy while at the same time protecting the environmental asset that sustains that economy and indeed sustains the communities who need those livelihoods. I'm not sure at this point whether the guidance that Graham Day uh, mentioned uh, that is now the Scottish Government is committed to bringing forward at stage two on sustainable development will be adequate enough. We need to look carefully at this. Uh, there must be a duty to consider and deliver sustainable development through this bill. Um, presiding officer, just in, in closing, um, I would uh, just reflect on what the minister said at the beginning of this uh, debate, where he said that uh, there'll be a need to maintain and seek to enhance the value 
of these important assets. Clearly, we're going to need some flexibility in that regard. We have this historic 9% reinvestment figure, uh, which allows revenue uh, to be reinvested back in assets. Clearly, if we're to invest in these assets for the future, to give the chance of future generations to grow their livelihoods, then we need to revisit that. There may be a need to set a much higher level of reinvestment so that we can ensure that these assets are there for the long term and they can sustain communities. Thank you. I call Alec Rowley to close for Labour. Five minutes, Mr Rowley. President Officer, I welcome the debate today and would also like to, uh, like others, acknowledge the work of the committee clerks and all those who gave up their time to give evidence to the committee. It was interesting when taking evidence from tenant farmers that they also expressed the view that it was good to come to Parliament and have their voices heard, something we should do more of and a point that was made by Richard Lockhead. Uh, Richard Lyle said that there were issues for some tenant farmers and I do hope these can be addressed and indeed that the key stakeholders such as tenants can feel empowered moving forward. As Claudia Beamish and others made clear, when we speak about assets within the Crown Estate, we are speaking about many irreplaceable national assets, and as such, we must ensure that they are protected, well managed, and provide social, economic, and environmental benefits for all of Scotland. The resources themselves are extensive, and as a result, their management is of vital concern to the future of both our natural environment and our rural economy, but also our energy needs as a country moving forward in the 21st century. Like Graham Day and other members of the committee, I welcome the Smith Commission's recommendations to devolve the Crown Estate. But as Colin Smith said, devolution is simply not about shifting powers from one centralised parliament to another. I strongly believe that where it is appropriate and where there is good reason to do so, we must be willing to devolve powers down from Holyrood to local government and indeed into local communities. When we devolve powers, those powers must be devolved for a purpose. And with regard to the dev devolution of the Crown Estate, as Joe Fitzpatrick said, we have an opportunity to strengthen the management of the asset by creating a balance between local and central decision making. In particular, the Smith Commission was clear in seeking full devolution to the three Scottish Island local authorities, and I would urge the Scottish Government to uphold that recommendation. This sentiment is echoed by the National Trust for Scotland, who have stated emphasis should be put on ensuring management is devolved as far as is practically possible. As John Scott said, good management is central to the successful future of the Crown Estate assets. But for me, key to this is local communities having a say over the land around them. This Parliament must also have an ongoing ability to hold Ministers to account for the Crown Estate. And I do note the strongly held views being expressed by a number of organisations that the seabed and the foreshore should not in any way be able to be sold off without the agreement of this Parliament. The Committee say that it should not be sold off full stop. And I note the point that Tavik Scott makes about the islands. I think it is a welcome development in the Bill to attempt to widen the focus of the Crown Estate management beyond the duty of securing a commercial return. The wider objectives within Section 7 of the Bill now include economic development, regeneration, social well-being, environmental well-being and sustainable development. As RSPB have stated, Scottish Crown Estate assets must be managed in accordance with the guiding principles of sustainable development to create and maintain a strong, healthy and just society capable of living within the environmental limits. There must be a duty to strike a balance and achieve parity between the financial obligations and the wider sustainable development of the assets. 
devolution of the Crown Estate can create opportunities for community land ownership, and this should be pursued by the Scottish Government, as well as new opportunities for new partnership working that should be exploited to the full. The Bill is a step in the right direction, and what we now have is an opportunity as a Parliament to come together to strengthen the Bill so that it delivers for the people of Scotland first and foremost. These assets belong to all of us, and commercial profits should never be at the forefront of managing our land. Thank you. And I call upon Lee Carson to close the Conservatives. Five minutes, please, Mr. Carson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I start by declaring an interest as a member of the NFUS and refer members to my register of interest. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to sum up for the Scottish Conservatives stage one of this important piece of legislation. I want to reiterate my support and that of my colleagues for this bill in principle. However, as it goes through the parliamentary process, we want to ensure that this bill is strengthened at stage two and three to ensure it delivers what it's intended and the objectives of the Smith Commission and Crown Estate are met. This bill has been laid as part of the Smith Commission's recommendation. Very refreshing, particularly on a day when we've heard yet more nonsense about power grabs and the Scottish Government's voice not being heard. Here we have a perfect example of extra powers and devolution in action. I anticipate that the bill will offer benefits to local authorities, public bodies and community organisations right across Scotland by encouraging community empowerment whilst ensuring that sustainability in its broadest sense, as mentioned by Stuart Stevenson and others, is at the heart of the Crown Estate's future. Graham Day and Edward Mountain, as I do, have concerns around fragmentation and the possible consequences a consequential impact on the financial stability of marginal operations if the well-performing parts of the state are sold off. We do need an audit and clear indication of the current and ongoing assets of the state's assets and liabilities. With regards to the agricultural estates, I'm very concerned and surprised with the position I understand the Greens are to take with suggested amendments with the presumption of devolution to local authorities. This is despite Mark Ruskell hearing the concerns of the tenants and others and, and could ultimately remove the ability of fully devolved community empowerment on that point. MD. I thank Finley Carson for giving away. I, I wonder if the member like me uh, wonders why Mr Whiteman uh, failed to bring forward his proposals during the stage one consideration of the bill when the committee could have examined these proposals and the stakeholders could have had their views heard. And I wonder if he agrees with me, that would be more respectful of the parliamentary process and most importantly of all, allow the stakeholders to have their voice heard on them. Finlay Carson. Prevention, I, I think it's very useful and, and I agree with everything that the member says. Because with, with due respect to the likes of Dumfries and Galloway Council as a local authority, I do not believe that they currently have the expertise or experience or the desire to be responsible for the upkeep of the resources at the Applegarth estate, for example, whereas I do have the confidence that a group of existing tenants have exactly the skills required. That's why when we, have pol we need policies uh, enabling more control being handed down at local level, but they must be accompanied with robust guidance and careful consideration and transparently in conjunction with stakeholders, not least the tenants. Decentralisation should not and cannot be railroaded through against the wishes of those who ultimately matter the most, and in this case, that's Crown Estate tenants. Mark Ruskell, believe it or not, was in the committee when he heard that the Tenant Farmers Association are firmly of the view that the four estates would be more, appropriately, more appropriate for the rural estates to be managed directly by the Scottish Government. In addition, Jim Innes of the Glenlivet Estate references the example of Murray Council, and he says, and I quote, we don't really want things to be devolved down to councils because Murray Council, for example, has a big enough job running its own show. I'm sorry, I don't have time. The NFUS has also rightly stated that the long-term stability and well-being of the rural estates and rural communities is paramount. And they also share concerns over the devolving of assets to local authorities. The NFUS believe that local authorities simply do not have nor will be able to obtain the necessary skill sets to manage agricultural units. We share that opinion. The Crown Estate Management Team at national level has a structure that is far more towards the interests of the tenants than local authorities could ever be. That's why the Scottish Conservatives agree the unanimous uh, clear recommendation which the Greens supported that the national management of the Crown Estates for rural estates should be continued. 
Along with Richard Lyle, I'm pleased to hear that the Crown Estate tenants have been generally happy with how the interim management has been run, feeling a greater connectivity with the estate, improved communications and more involvement. I believe that the expertise and experience currently in place is the best solution for the upkeep of the resources at Applegarth and other rural estates, which is why it's important to retain something akin to the status quo. I'm sorry, I don't have time. The Crown Estate Bill represents another important juncture in the history of Scottish Parliament. These powers that have been devolved to the Scottish Parliament as a result of cross-party work during the Smith Commission, that is devolution in its best form, but we must make sure that the Crown Estate Bill meets the needs of stakeholders and the most appropriate management structures are identified in each individual case. Presiding Officer, I look forward to supporting this bill in principle in a few moments and progressing the Crown Estate Bill further as the summer break. Thank you very much. I now call on Joe Fitzpatrick to wind up the debate. Thank you, President Officer. This has been uh, an excellent debate and the, the speeches across the Chamber will, I'm sure, give, give the Cabinet Secretary and officials uh, lots to reflect on. The Cabinet Secretary, of course, will, will take that time to reflect on a number of the, the issues that have been, been raised, um, but with the help of, of the, the team uh, from the Bill team have been passing me lots of uh, notes, um, I will do my best to cover as many of the points that have been raised in the debate. Yeah. Richard Lockhead. And in the point of reflection, a number of members have raised the issue of uh, Auchenhalrig Farm in the Fockabers estate in my constituency, and that's also been raised by many of my constituents. Will uh, the Minister urge the Cabinet Secretary to reflect on the concerns that have been expressed with a potential for perhaps intervening if that's appropriate? And if the Crown Estate are looking to raise funds, will the Scottish Government make representations to the UK Government to get £167 million back? from the Fort Kinnaird share that was declared a UK asset and not a Scottish asset when it came to devolution of the Crown Estate assets, because that's Scottish money and they should be conning us out of it. Joe Patrick. <clears throat> Member makes uh, two strong points which I am sure are, are now on the record and the Cabinet Secretary will of course uh, look at both of them. Um, in the course of the debate, um, Graham Day and uh, Claudia Beamish um, made some points about the, the concept of good management. Um, so the bill, in the bill there is a duty to maintain and enhance the value of the, the Crown Estate assets um, and the manager may do, do so in a way that is likely to promote socio-economic and environmental matters. This is a duty is instead of a specific reference to good management. So although it is not there in those words of good management, it is, I, we think, um, encapsulated. Um, Graeme Day also um, made a point um, about the scope and whether there should, there should be wider environmental factors should be taken into account and, and the duty to maintain and enhance the value is required um, but managers may meet this duty in a way which contributes um, not just to economic value but also to sustainable development, economic development and social well-being. Um, Graham Day, Mark Ruskell and Peter Chapman all made points in relation to the retention of 9% of revenues um, by the manager um, and, and questioning whether that was the correct figure, questioning whether we should examine that. And while we've kept the existing figure of 9% under the interim arrangements, the bill provides flexibility to vary, vary, vary that and we will keep the 9% under review. Tavish Scott made a specific point um, in relation to trust ports um, in, in terms of the, the need to, to pay to the Crown Estates um, and new powers in the bill um, to weigh up the profit to the state with the wider benefit. So that's something that is new that doesn't exist just now and so hopefully that will be helpful in terms of the specific point that Mr Scott made. Mr Scott um, and um, Mr Whiteman both made um, similar points um, looking for, I think, a, a stronger um, and simpler approach. And, but it, we, we do need to bear in mind um, that management, not ownership, is what is, has been devolved here. The bill will enable local management of assets, um, and currently there are no legal powers exist to do that. Um, so, yes. Andy Whiteman. Except that Schedule 5, Section 3.1 of the Scotland Act 1998 devolves, and I quote, property belonging to Her Majesty and right to the Crown. This Parliament's always had, as the Scottish Law Commission has confirmed, the rights to legislate over Crown property rights. 
Minister. That this specific bill relates to the devolution of, of, of the, the powers um, in relation to, to management. A number um, of uh, members raised John Scott, Claudia Beamish, uh, Richard Lyle, Graham Day, Alex Rowley and others all raised points around um, uh, about the seabed and, and, and arguing that seabed should never be sold off. I think there's some different variations of that. And, but the, the bill does make it a requirement that a manager obtains uh, consent of Scottish ministers before seabed can be sold. That's a new requirement, so it goes further than ever before. Um, and, I, and I think that the point is that there are some circumstances where I think we would be able to see that it might be the right thing to do, and it might be something that's required. Some instances, such as, um, for instance, under the footfall of the Queensbury crossing. So the, there are, I, I think we all agree, exceptions um, to that. So the power should remain there, but there is a requirement for that to come back to Scottish ministers and therefore that parliamentary oversight to the whole um, thing. Andy Whiteman and John Scott um, both made points in relation to staff. Um, uh, Crown State staff and Scottish Government officials are working with Crown State Scotland. Um, sorry, time is disappearing. Cro Claudia Beamish and Richard Lockhead both made points around uh, transparency and the bill provides for this and also um, that management plans will be published and accounts laid in Parliament. So that's all things that are new, which increases the um, transparency of the bill. I see the clock ticking. Um, I think if I go back to my very, very start, the Cabinet Secretary um, will be paying close attention to everything that was said in, in the, the debate today. Um, if members have particular points they want to take up with her or her officials, I'm sure she'll be very pleased to do that prior to the stage two. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister and members. That concludes our stage one debate on the Scottish Crown Estate Bill. Uh, the next item of business is consideration of motion 11939 in the name of Derek Mackay on a financial resolution for the Scottish Crown Estate Bill. And could I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion? Formally moved. Thank you very much. We come now to decision time. There are two questions today. The first question is that motion 12846 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on the Scottish Crown Estate Bill at stage one be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 11939 in the name of Derek Mackay on a financial resolution for the Scottish Crown Estate Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move on now to members' business. And it's in the name of Gillian Martin on welcoming Women and Engineering Day. We'll just take a few moments to change seats and I'll suspend Parliament for a few moments to allow members to change in the gallery or new guests to arrive. 